members, both declaration signers. I know a lot about both of them, and it, it's, it's, you know, there's so much to talk about. But I have to start with one thing about Larry, just in case you don't know. You know, a lot of us try to get interesting spokespeople for our businesses and products. Let's face it, right? We, we like mascots, we like famous people. He's in the energy efficiency business, and it's not easy to make that sexy. Let's just be honest, okay? <laughs> Larry managed to get Ellen DeGeneres to give away a KB home on her show, okay? I'm impressed. I've never asked Larry about their relationship, but again, what's said at the bicep breakfast stays at the bicep breakfast. So I don't know if you're going to comment on that, but you know, we, we have hopes of getting, getting these kinds of topics out into the public eye. Uh, interesting, and that was one accomplishment. There's a clip that you can actually see where they give away and they show the, the thick walls and, and all of that. Uh, maybe we'll see that someday. I'm going to ask you the same question, and Cynthia, I'm going to start with you, because what might be on the mind of a lot of the folks at the breakfast here is, given your portfolio of having to help your company be more sustainable, work on your reporting, your carbon footprint, your goal setting, your measuring, your monitoring, your own budget, can you tell us just how you got your company to also agree to step out in political advocacy and climate and energy policy in such an assertive way? Um, thank you, Anne. I, and I want to hear about the Ellen DeGeneres thing, because that's very cool. Uh, we haven't quite gotten that cool yet. Um, so it, it actually started, uh, and I will shorten the, the story, but it started way back when, uh, you know, we agreed to join BICEP, I'd recommend it to our company, that, I mean, that, to our company that we joined series with the intent at some point down the line of joining BICEP, but we didn't, you know, we weren't going to get both with, with one single cell. Um, Mindy came in and met with our CEO, as she does when you join series. And our CEO at the time, he has since retired, came away going, I was thinking I was going to have a meeting with like a tree hugger. Yeah. And she actually is very business minded. And I'm like, yes, because this is all about business. And, you know, and it's always putting it in that context. Fast forward, um, what I have found helpful is you put something forward for, uh, for them to sign off on and put it in the language that you want to see ultimately get agreed to, and then let them respond to that and let them change it if they want to change it. So I put forward, uh, I think we need to have a position on the pr a price on carbon. And that developed an awful lot of dialogue, and I put all the reasons why I felt we need to have that position of um, articulating our support for a price on carbon, not saying carbon tax, but just say, using the term a price on carbon, and um, felt it was a leadership position. We like to be in leadership positions, and, and, and. Got that bought off on, and, and my CEO said, I want to do this, I agree with you, I want to do this because I would prefer us to be in the driver's seat, or at least influencing policy as opposed to reacting to it. And I was like, oh, that's a very good one. So when this came up, it, it was just taking out that line from prior uh, discussions and saying, this is everything that we stand for. It is very much in line with our desire to be seen as a leader and to lead by example. And so you kind of when you, when you're put it in that context, it was hard to say no. Got it. Convincing case. Larry, same question? Your thoughts? Uh, for us, it was, uh, it started with our CEO, and I, I suspect in the case of many companies, um, you need to have uh, the CEO either initiate or think that he or she has initiated the idea of uh, <laughs> stepping out in an environmental world. And uh, that uh, sent the signal you know, through the company. Uh, we also, in our company, I, I think have a disproportionately uh, high number of Gen Y people who uh, are often always picking me up off the floor. And uh, uh, I, I do discern a, 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 a greater commitment to um, environmental protection uh, in the millennial uh, generation than, than in uh, the generation that people like Carl and I uh, come from. Uh, uh, and so it was easy to get the company behind us uh, in, a, in a big way. Now, um, also in our industry, um, 
uh, we have intense competition, and so we looked at this as a market differentiator uh, that maybe would distinguish us uh, not only with um, doing things like having Ellen DeGeneres, we've also had, by the way, had Martha Stewart, The Simpsons, um, <laughs> I don't know, who, over the last few years, uh, who have helped us sell homes. But um, it's, a, it's a challenge, which I'll comment about later, of, of getting the retail public to want to buy in. But for starters, it was internal in the company, uh, coupled with market differentiators, uh, coupled with um, uh, some great partnerships we've had with some of the NGOs who have helped us immensely uh, uh, institute our um, uh, environmentally <coughs> protective features in our homes. Uh, the, the NRDC has been a partner of ours for probably 15 years, AARP, uh, and a number of local environmental uh, groups around the country have all um, uh, given us ideas that um, have helped us build homes that are better and uh, more efficient and, and less expensive. Right, and just want to hold, hold your microphone close so we can all hear you. Can you just give us the 30 seconds on what the KB home is, the ultimate KB home, the, the zero energy home, your, your absolute model? We, uh, we've gone around the country excuse me, with a, um, a program of building net zero energy homes. Uh, we've done several in the Bay Area, we've done them in the D.C. area, and then uh, throughout the country. A net zero, and, and by the way, we've taken politicians on these tours because everyone talks net zero, but has no idea what it really looks like or, or is or feels like in a home. But, you know, basic features would include things like uh, ultra low E windows, uh, dense insulation, uh, radiant barrier in the attic that can reduce um, uh, by about 25 degrees in the summer the heat trapped in, in the attic. Um, we include water in a big way, and since we're in California, I would say that because so much of the electricity consumed in this state and throughout the Southwest are just spent on pumping water around the state, uh, it, uh, water conservation is a big part of our program as well. So we would have, we'll have faucets and um, sinks and toilets, uh, 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 Kohler and Moen and the other companies that uh, give us these things. Smog eating tile, uh, which uh, the press loves to write about. Uh, this is uh, taking tiles and treating them with uh, a titanium dioxide compound that um, uh, actually uh, causes the tiles to, in effect, eat nitrogen dioxide. And of course, this is like you know the monster that devoured Cleveland. So the media <laughs> love love this. It, it kind of distracts from what we're really trying to do uh, because, it, in fact, um, nobody. Almost nobody will actually buy these tiles because you're you're doing something that is good societally, but you're not helping your own wallet out. And one of the things I'll touch on is that we found that the only, about the only way to really sell homes is through the wallet and uh, sell environmental features is through the wallet. And um, uh, that case uh, that that makes climate change too much of an abstract concept for our customers. Something that we'll get into. So I'm interested in those the, the tile. That's hot. And I'm sure members of the media are going to want to ask Larry about that, that later. But many of you have faced this dilemma. I mean, Larry's selling an incredibly environmentally sound home at a competitive price. The one in, in Waldorf, Maryland, I think was $400,000, a good-looking home that actually gives back energy to the grid. And you have faced this question of selling it to consumers. But there's another topic you and I have talked about, and I know others have felt this, and I want Cynthia to comment on it, too. And we have investors in the room, so the famous quarterly calls when you try to talk about your progress and your environmental innovations, uh, which, which you've gone to at some cost to the company. Can you talk a little bit about what that's been like to try to convince the investors on the call? What recommendations you have to try to, this, this is sort of the bread and butter of series, to try to get this message across. I know you've grappled with it, and I think folks would be interested in your take. We, you're right, we wrestle with this every single day, and, and the issue is this. You know, uh, publicly traded companies like most of the companies in the room here uh, have your quarterly earnings call. And um, your CEO and CFO are pressed as to what they think is going to be uh, the business uh, quarter or maybe two quarters out from today. Uh, and then, of course, they, that's, that's what the analysts are looking for. And, but uh, there's a little ritualistic kabuki that goes on, and we avoid commenting on that. Now, over the last few years, uh, our CEO has spent a lot of time on the call, t 
talking about all these great things that we do environmentally. Uh, when uh, he's done talking, um, the analysts just focus laser-like on, all right, what's, you know, how many houses are you going to sell next quarter? How many houses are you going to sell the quarter after that? Zero interest in our environmental um, uh, efforts. Uh, very, very frustrating. Um, and, uh, you know, makes it tough on our board of directors. You know, they'll, they'll ask, why are we spending money? Why are we, why do we have a lower rate of return than the builder down the street who isn't offering these features? Uh, we can only go on so long doing that. And uh, we need, I think we need the, the sustainability side of big investment banking firms to talk to the analyst side of the investment banking firms to breathe a little bit of concern about um, environmentalism. Because there's, and there is a long-term, um, value in this too. I think companies that prepare themselves for the long term uh, are going to succeed ultimately. So I think there is a hook there for the analysts to, uh, to, to grab onto, but they certainly are not at this time. Uh, so frustration. Yeah, that's where we are. Cynthia, your thoughts? Yeah, I completely echo the frustration. If we had one question that was asked um, on uh, any of our quarterly calls, just one, it would make a huge difference with our e-suite um, because we hear the same things they're not asking you know we 